Well, good morning. And thank you guys so much for joining us this morning. My name is Danny Bolin. I'm the worship pastor here at Eagles View Church. Pastor Bart is he's out this week. He had surgery on Monday. He is feeling really good. He wishes he could be here. He wanted me to tell you how much he loves you all, and he wishes he could be here today. But he is feeling much better, and he will be here next week. He's going to be speaking next week. So uh, look forward to that. Um, turn in your Bibles today to 1 Samuel chapter 24. That's our main passage that we're going to be going through today. So anyone who knows me knows that I'm a bit of a rebel. I, uh, I've, I've been that way my whole life. I, I don't like following stupid rules or people that don't deserve to be followed. Um, but Pastor Bart asked me to speak today and uh, it's about Saul and David in this story where David has this chance to take down Saul, to bring down his whole kingdom, and David chooses the right path. And this has been a week full of conviction for me and repentance because I've looked back at my life at several different situations where I chose the wrong way. And um, I, I started thinking this week one story that came to my mind. When I was in high school, I was in the youth choir at our church, and our youth choir every year went on this great uh, mission trip slash choir tour at the end of the year. And my brother at the time was, was the youth choir director uh, of the youth choir. He was also the associate pastor at our church. And in my junior year of high school, we went to New England. It was a really cool trip. Um, and uh, my youth pastor decided to join us on this trip. And he was a, a 24-year-old, really, really young guy. He was really fun, but he made a lot of really Stupid, stupid decisions. Um, he brought a gorilla suit on choir tour, didn't tell anybody that, and had a plan that one night he would go into the guys and girls' rooms at night, the uh, high school guys and girls, and wake them up in the middle of the night while he was wearing the gorilla suit and videotape the poor, unsuspecting souls. And uh, he went into my room that night, and I'm a really heavy sleeper. I didn't really even remember it the next day. He got a really good reaction. Um, but I wasn't that offended. However, one of my friends, who was a young lady, was uh, deathly afraid of gorillas. And she was one of the unsuspecting victims of this prank. And when he went to her, her room that night, while she was sleeping, when he woke her up, she freaked out. She started convulsing. She was bawling, crying. She couldn't sleep the rest of the night. And my little sister and I became really close at this time, and she is just like me. She has a strong sense of justice and has, is a bit of a rebel herself. And my friend was her friend as well. And we both got really angry about this. We were so upset that they would do this or that he would do this, our youth pastor. And we had a lot of influences, influence with the other students on tour. So we started talking to everyone who would listen about how, how unjust this was and how terrible they were for doing this. And we effectively led a mutiny on the choir tour. The entire student choir was angry at him. The trip went sour really quickly. It was because of us. We always did this final concert at home, at our, at our home church, at the end of the tour. And during that night, the, our, my older brother, who was leading the tour, he had to take me and my little sister off the stage to the choir room while the concert was going with the youth pastor to try to reconcile. It was so bad. I missed my big solo on stage. But we were really unpre unrepentant. Um, we said what we needed to say to get through that awkward moment and but here's the thing the youth pastor was wrong he did something bad he made a mistake and I should have gone to him immediately and talked it out with him and shared how he had offended us he was a good guy he would have he would have owned up to what he did and and he he made a stupid mistake but we could have all moved on from that but instead I went for the jugular I wanted to see him fall and I did things and said things that I can't take back now. And my brother, who did nothing wrong, was very hurt by the whole situation. I was really, really terribly wrong in my response. And I still think about what I did, and I cringe to this day, and I have guilt because of that. Have you ever been wronged by one of your leaders? Have you ever been 
or are currently under an authority in your life that is someone who doesn't deserve to be followed, that they don't deserve your respect or, or devotion. David certainly was in that situation, and we can learn a lot from his response in a situation like that. We've been in this series about David for the last few weeks. We left off last week, and we, Bar, Pastor Bart talked about David and Jonathan and their friendship together, and uh, Jonathan is Saul's son. And in chapter 18 and 19, Saul tries to kill David four different times, but Jonathan helps David escape. Saul is chasing after David relentlessly. He wants him dead, and he will, he will cut down anything or any person that's in his way in order to get to David. Saul is blinded by his own insecurity and pride. There's a story in chapter 21 and 22 where David goes to seek help from the priests in the town of Nov, where they help him by giving him bread from the temple and the sword or the, the, the spear of Goliath, who David killed a few chapters earlier. And when Saul hears that the priest helped David, he goes ballistic. He loses his mind. He goes and slaughters 85 of Yahweh's priests, and then he kills all of their wives and children as well. Saul was seen as a hero in his younger days, but now he's officially become the villain. He's officially moved from Anakin to Vader at this point. And this brings us to chapter 24. Saul's pursuing David, and he wants David dead. David has 600 men with him, and he goes to a place called En Gedi. En Gedi is an oasis on the west side of the Dead Sea. In the middle of a giant, vast wilderness, there's this small stream that flows down to the Dead Sea. You can look on the picture there. And over thousands of years, the stream has flowed and it's carved into the rocks, these cliffs on both sides. And on the cliffs on either side of the river, there are these cave systems that are, are great to hide in. And following the stream, there's a beautiful, lush greenery that goes on either side of the stream that the stream feeds and, and, and waters. And there would be goats and other wildlife that would enjoy the benefits of this stream. And that's where En Gedi gets its name. It's, it, in Hebrew, the word literally means, means goat springs. So this is a great military strategic place to hide for David. You would have food because of the goats. You'd have water because of the stream. And then a great place to hide up in the cave system. So there's clear strategic reasons why David chooses this place. But I don't think this is the only reason why God wanted David here in this moment. I heard Hebrew and biblical scholar Tim Mackey of the Bible Project say that the Hebrew letters that form the words in Gedi are actually the exact same Hebrew letters that form the words Garden of Eden. But they're all mixed up. But it's the same letters. So when I look this up, and it's true, and you may be thinking, okay, Danny, that may be a little far-fetched to make that connection to Genesis 3 in the, in the fall. But I don't think it was an accident that the biblical authors were, were winking at this. The biblical authors do stuff like this all the time. If this was the only time something like this happened, it might, be, uh, it might not mean very much. But the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, the biblical authors are constantly calling back to different stories in the narrative. They have things in the narrative, wordplay and hinting where and where events happened are very important. They were, the biblical authors were literary geniuses. They, um, they were under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And I don't think it's an accident that they would be winking at the story of the greatest test of all humanity while also telling the story of David's greatest test that defines his life and his favor from God. In a second, we're going to look at some other ways that this story points to Genesis 3. But for now, let's read. Let's start reading in chapter 24, starting in verse 1. It says this. After Saul returned from fighting the Philistines, he was told that David had gone into the wilderness of En Gedi. So Saul chose 3,000 elite troops from all Israel and went to search for David and his men near the rocks of the wild goats. All at, at that place... The, uh, at the place where the road passes some sheepfolds, Saul went into the cave and relieved himself. But as it happened, David and his men were hiding farther back in that very cave. Okay, so 
we need to pause for a second. So Saul and his men are out by the stream searching for David to kill him. And if Saul was playing a game of hot and cold, Saul kept getting warmer and warmer and warmer and then colder, colder. But then warmer again and then now he's red hot. But he doesn't even know it. The text says that Saul went into the cave to relieve himself. I don't really want to explain this, but I'm going to have to. The actual Hebrew phrase here is that Saul went into the cave to cover his feet. That is a Hebrew euphemism for using the restroom. So Saul and his men are in the valley searching for David. They're, it's probably in the morning time. Saul probably just finished his morning coffee. And he's like, guys, I got to poop. I did not want to go here, but it's in the Bible. Okay, Bart asked me to speak on this so that he didn't have to be the one to explain that. Okay, let's keep reading. But as it happened, David, his men, David and his men were hiding farther back in that very cave. That's embarrassing. Now's your opportunity, David's men whispered to him. Today, the Lord is telling you, I will certainly put your enemy into your power to do with as you wish. So David is being tempted by his own men. What the Hebrew literally says here is that David's men said, this is the day God has given your enemy into your hand. Do what looks good to your eyes. They tell David, this is the day God told you he would deliver your enemy into your hand. The thing is that there's no record of God saying that that to David. There's a chapter earlier where David's fighting the Philistines and God tells him that, that he's going to deliver him, that he's going to deliver the Philistines into his hand. But as the reader, we should be wondering why David's men are putting words in Yahweh's mouth and twisting what he says a little bit. Robert Bergen says in his commentary on 1 and 2 Samuel, he says, This prophecy is not mentioned elsewhere in Scripture and probably represents an example of false prophecy. Alternatively, it may have been a genuine prophecy relating to non-Israelite enemies misapplied to Saul. So David's men say something false about what God said. They twist something that God has said to David, and then they tell him, Do what looks good in your eyes. If you know the story of the test of all humanity in Genesis 3, this language should start to sound familiar to you. Let's read Genesis 3, verses 1 through 6. We're going to read out of the New American Standard. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? That's not what God said. He's twisting it. Do you see that? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Like God. That's, that was the temptation, to be like God. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. So you see how the language is the same. This is David's Garden of Eden moment. The reason Adam and Eve took the fruit was because the serpent said if they did, they would be like God. God had already made them king and queen over all creation, but they chose to reach up and take power that didn't belong to them. They took matters into their own hands. Literally into their hands. David is faced With the same choice. Will he reach up and take power and kingship for himself? Or is he going to trust God? And and trust that God's not holding out on him? And trust that God wants the best for him? God, you promised that I would be king. 
You're taking too long. Will David do what is good in his own eyes, like Adam and Eve did, and elevate himself and exalt himself, or is he going to wait for God to elevate him and exalt him? 1 Samuel 24, verse 4 says, So David crept forward and cut off a piece of the hem of Saul's robe. When, David, when David's conscience hit him, began bothering him because he had cut Saul's robe, he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this to my lord the king. I shouldn't attack the Lord's anointed one, for the Lord himself has chosen him. So David restrained his men and did not let them kill Saul. So we have to just imagine this moment. David and his men, they're hiding in some random cave in En Gedi. Saul and his army of 3,000 men are, are down by the stream, and Saul has to go. And when you got to go, you got to go, Right? He chooses the exact cave where David and his men are hiding. And the king of Israel goes by himself to that cave to do his business. We are meant to laugh at this. This is irony at its finest. He's in about the most vulnerable, vulnerable position anyone could be in. It looks like this is David's moment. So what this story brings to the surface is this idea of, of godly wisdom versus worldly wisdom. Worldly wisdom says David should have ended this whole thing right there. I started thinking this week about reasons why David should have killed Saul right then and there. So here's some of the reasons. First of all, self-defense. Saul was actively pursuing David with the intent to kill him. Killing Saul would have been seen as an act of self-defense, and it would have been self-defense. He would have been clean. Uh, the, the, uh, the peace, killing Saul, would have ended the constant threat and pursuit, allowing David and his men to finally live in peace. David had the popular support. Many in Israel were disillusioned with Saul's leadership. They were ready for David to take the throne. David was a national hero at this time. There was even a catchy tune that they sang about him. Bart talked about that last week. David, or Saul has killed his thousands. David has killed his ten thousands. David had a legitimate claim to the throne. David was the rightful king. He had been, he had been anointed by Samuel the prophet. And as future king of Israel, by killing Saul, David could have expedited his ascension to the throne. It could have been seen as divine will, and his men saw it that way. Some might argue that since David was anointed by God to be king, it was God's will for David to kill Saul and to take the throne by any means necessary. Political stability. With Saul out of the picture, there would have been much less political infighting and division. David loved the nation of Israel. It was his home. It seemed clear that Saul was growing more and more mentally unstable. Saul was a cancer to Israel. David knew that that it, 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 it wouldn't have only been selfish for him to kill Saul. It would have also been seen as noble by many people. He could have done it to protect his followers. David had a group of loyal followers who were also at risk because of Saul's pursuit. Killing Saul would have ensured their safety. Remember the story of the priests, the 85 priests from a few chapters earlier, how they all got slaughtered because of, of helping David. He could have, if by killing Saul, he could have prevented that from happening again. David had the moral high ground. Some would argue that Saul's disobedience to God and, and God's commands had lost Saul the authority to lead. David, as Saul's chosen, had the moral responsibility to remove him. Now, let's look at some of the reasons why David shouldn't kill Saul. He's God's anointed. It would have been a sin to kill him. That's all I could come up with. This is a toughie. So instead of killing Saul, David sneaks up behind him and he cuts off a piece of the hem of Saul's robe. And scripture says that David feels bad even about that. He feels guilty for cutting off just a little piece of his robe. He didn't even kill Saul. He just cut off a little piece of the robe. But David was convicted by this. This really shows how, how sensitive and how soft David's heart was. 
And he saw even the small act of cutting Saul's robe as something wrong and offensive. Something he shouldn't have done. His heart is why David, his, his heart is why God chose David. David passes the test here. He cares so much more about what God thinks of him than what the rest of the kingdom of Israel think of him and his men think of him. He doesn't reach up and take the power. He decides to trust God and trust God's timing. David was a man after God's own heart. If he didn't know God's heart, then he would have killed Saul right then and there. This was a test for David. Is he going to be like every other king that's ever existed? Or is he going to do this God's way? David had the Holy Spirit and he listened. See, God's wisdom and worldly wisdom are rarely ever the same. Worldly wisdom says faster is better. Smarter is better. More powerful is better. Better is better. It says easy equals good. And hard equals bad. This is not God's way of doing things. He constantly, our God constantly chooses the weaker. He chooses the second born, the ones that the world sees as worthless and powerless. He chooses the hard way. God, godly wisdom says that hard doesn't equal bad. In fact, most of the things in this life that are worth anything, that give us joy and meaning in our lives, are really hard. The story of David perfectly illustrates godly wisdom. He was, David was the smallest and weakest in his family, but God chose him anyway. David went up against Goliath, a small shepherd boy who had no name. And God killed Goliath through David. David didn't take the easy path when it was right there in front of him in the cave. He took the hard path. David chose godly wisdom. He would rather continue to suffer than to do anything that displeased God. But those are the type of people that God uses. The people who don't trust in their own power because they don't have any. But they fully rely on God to save them. See, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 30 talks about this. The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. As the, wis as the scriptures say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. So where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars, and the world's brilliant debaters? God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish. Since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom, he has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. It is foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven, and it's foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended, and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. But to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. This foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans. And God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose the things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose the things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. This is the way our God works. He chooses to work through weak and messed up people. And that's how he chooses to accomplish his plans. Does that give you encouragement today? It does to me. Let's keep reading in 1 Samuel chapter 24. David came out and shouted after him, My Lord, the king! And when Saul looked around, David bowed low before him. Then he shouted to Saul, 
Why do you listen to the people who say I am trying to harm you? This very day you can see with your own eyes it isn't true. For the Lord placed you at my mercy back in the cave. and Some of my men told me to kill you, but I spared you. For I said, I will never harm the king. He is the Lord's anointed one. Look, my father, at what I have in my hand. It's a piece of the hem of your robe. I cut it off, but I didn't kill you. This proves that I am not trying to harm you and that I have, and I have not sinned against you, even though you have been hunting for me to kill me. May the Lord judge between us. Perhaps the Lord will punish you for what you are trying to do to me. But I will never harm you. For the, old prophet, for the old proverb says, from evil people come evil deeds. So you can be sure I will never harm you. Who is the king of Israel trying to catch anyway? Should he spend his time chasing one who is as worthless as a dead dog or a single flea? May the Lord therefore judge which of us is right and punish the guilty one. He is my advocate and he will rescue me from your power. David is something else. This is not the way that any of us would respond in this situation. He bows his head low to the ground in reverence to Saul. He uses extremely reverent and respectful language when addressing Saul. He uses words like, my Lord the King, and the Lord's anointed one, and my Father. Then he uses very humble language to refer to himself. He says he's as worthless as a dead dog or a single flea. And he says, I'm not going to kill you. Even though you're trying to kill me, I'm never going to try and kill you. Yahweh will deal with you, and I will appeal to him as my mediator. He will take care of the justice part, but my hand is not going to do it. See, we have this contrast here of the pride of Saul and the humility of David. We all know that pride and humility are opposites. But pride and humility are only side effects and they're only surface level for, for something. They're surface level showing. It's something showing of something that's way down underneath. The core of pride is insecurity. Insecurity in your identity leads to pride. A prideful person is always insecure in their identity. That's why they have to tell everyone how great they are all the time because they're not just trying to convince everyone else, they're trying to convince themselves. Insecurity happens when we don't really know who we are. And on the opposite end, the core of humility is confidence. Confidence in your identity leads to humility. Sometimes we view pride and confidence as the same thing, but they're actually opposites. Confidence is always under the surface of a humble person. A confident person doesn't need to tell you how great they are. They know who they are, and they know whose they are. They don't need to prove anything to anyone or to themselves. They don't need to reach up and take something that isn't theirs. You can see that in the story of David and Saul. David is he finds his identity and his confidence in God alone. He knows God's going to fight the battle. He doesn't have to prove anything. And you have Saul, who is filled with pride, who doesn't know who he is, who's insecure in his identity, and it presents with pride. That's why identity matters. So who are you? If you don't tell yourself who you are every day, the world will. If you don't tell yourself, or if you don't tell, if we don't tell our children who they are every single day, the world will label them, and they're going to believe the labels. Jesus was the most humble human to ever have lived, and he did not have a confidence problem. He was confident in who he was. He knew who he was, and he knew whose he was. Throughout his life, everyone around Jesus was constantly trying to get him to prove who he was. Prove who you are, Jesus. Show us a quick miracle. Show us a magic trick to prove who you are. Even the devil himself, when he tempts Jesus, he tempts him three different ways. They're all about pride, humility, 
an identity. He says to Jesus in the first two temptations, he says, if you're the son of God, then, then just make these stones into bread. We'll all know who you are. And then he takes him to the top of the temple building and he says, if you're, if you're the son of God, then jump off and God will save you. If, 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 you, if, you're, if you're the son of God, then prove it. And every time someone does this to Jesus, he's like, I'm not playing that game. I don't have to prove anything to you. I know who I am and I know whose I am. What you do doesn't define who you are. Who you are defines what you do. I want you just to, to, uh, to close your eyes just for a second. Would you do that all around this room? We're going to use the, the power of imagination for a second. And I want you just to imagine a business card in your mind. It's a blank business card, and I want you to put your name right across the top. Underneath your name, I want you to write who you are. Write dad or mom, sister or brother, son or daughter. Now write what you do for a living. Are you a nurse or a teacher or a salesman, insurance adjuster or stay-at-home mom? Whatever it is for you, fill in that blank there. Now what hobbies do you have? Are you a golfer, a baker, a candlestick maker? A collector, a writer, a gamer, a bird watcher. Write that in. Some of us have a lot of different hobbies. Write them all in. Now I want you to write some negative things about yourself. Some of us need bigger cards. You can make that bigger in your head to write those negative things. So if you've ever lied, then you are a... If you've ever lied, then you are a... There we go. So write that down. Cheater, glutton, addict, thief. Don't hold back. You're the only one looking at this. No one else is going to see it. But get real with yourself for a second. Write those things down. Now in your mind's eye, I want you to take a step back and look at that card. This is part of your essence. These things are Roles that you play, things that you do, or things you have done. Now I want you to turn your pencil around and use the eraser. If you thought you were using a pen, you weren't. It was a pencil, and it has an eraser on it, and now we're going to use that. I want you to erase every single thing on there except for your name. Erase it all. Now I want you to write two things. Child of the creator of the universe and priest. That's who you are. All that other stuff is junk. That's what defines you. We don't get our identity from anything we've done. You can look back at me now. If you got your identity because of something you've done, then you will lose your identity because of something you do. What you do doesn't define who you are. Who you are defines what you do. And if you are in Jesus, you are a son or a daughter of the creator of the universe. And he created the universe to live with you forever. That should give us a ridiculous amount of confidence. We didn't do anything to deserve that. But he loves us by no merit of our own. That's where our identity comes from. In the story, David holds up that piece of cloth that was cut from the hem of Saul's garment. This isn't the actual piece of cloth that, that David cut. Okay? I actually cut this off my wife's t-shirt this morning. Uh, she'll find out about that later. <laughs> but this was an extremely significant moment and a very significant uh, symbol in that moment. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, it tells a story of God's final condemnation of Saul. This is much earlier in the story. This is before David's even anointed. David is a shepherd boy in a field at this time. 
And God has given Saul very detailed instructions many times, and he chooses to do what is good in his own eyes. And this is the last straw. Samuel, the prophet, comes to Saul to rebuke him. In 1 Samuel 15, verse 24, it says, Then Saul admitted to Samuel, Yes, I have sinned. I have disobeyed your instructions and the Lord's command. For I was afraid of the people and did what they demanded. That doesn't sound like someone who's confident in their identity, does it? It sounds like someone who's insecure. But now please forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel replied, I will not go back with you since you have rejected the Lord's command. He has rejected you as king over Israel. As Samuel turned to go, Saul tried to hold him back and tore the hem of his robe. And Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to someone else. One who is better than you. David wasn't there. He was still a nobody, still a shepherd boy in a field at this time. He didn't know about this story. He didn't know about the hymn. But you can bet when David held that up to show Saul, Saul received a very clear reminder from God in that moment. God was sending a clear message to Saul with this little piece of cloth. Samuel's words were ringing in Saul's ears. David trusts God to save him from Saul and elevate him, and that's exactly what God does. The very sign that David used to prove that that he followed God and spared Saul's life is the very sign in his hand that would make Saul realize that David was the better man, that God was tearing the kingdom away from, from Saul and giving it to David. David was holding the very cloth in his hand. So let's read more of chapter 24. When David had finished speaking, Saul called back. Is that, is that really you, my son David? Remember, David calls Saul my father earlier. Now Saul is returning the favor. When he began to cry, then he began to cry. And he said to David, you are a better man than I am. Remember that from what Samuel said? In Samuel's prophecy. For you have repaid me good for evil. Yes, you have been amazingly kind to me today. For when the Lord put me in a place where you could have killed me, you didn't do it. In Hebrew, Saul says, you didn't kill me when God placed me into your hand. Remember, David doesn't take the fruit. Who else would let his enemy get away when he had him in his power? May the Lord reward you well for the kindness you have shown me today. And now I realize that you are surely going to be king and that the kingdom of Israel will flourish under your rule. Now swear to me by the Lord that when that happens, you will not kill my family or or destroy my line of descendants. So David promised this to Saul with an oath. Then Saul went home, but David and his men went back to their stronghold. So Saul accepts that David is the better man, the one who will take the throne one day. And then immediately Saul starts thinking about his descendants and his family. And he knows David one day is going to have the power to kill all of Saul's descendants. That's how a royal coup normally works. The the new king would come in and then kill all of the the descendants of the former king. That sounds a little bit like insecurity. David cut off Saul's robe and now Saul is saying, don't cut off any of my descendants. Saul doesn't know this, but David has already made this covenant with Saul's son, Jonathan. Jonathan and David were best friends, and Jonathan says, I know you're going to become king one day. And David says, you don't have to worry. I'm going to be kind to all of your descendants. So this is part of David's, this part of David's narrative. It highlights that David's ascent to the throne is not, is not because of some deceptive plan or a scheme or a military coup. He didn't need to kill Saul's family to prove anything to anyone. But David waited humbly and patiently for God to raise him up as king. He suffered as Israel's true king. He suffered in the wilderness, allowing Saul to chase him. Yahweh is working out 
his purpose uh, to raise up a humble, afflicted, anointed one who is not going to exalt himself, but a king who will trust God and do and, and trust that God is going to do the exalting. And only after a period of suffering and a period of refining in the wilderness will God finally crown David as king. This part of David's story is crucial to understanding who God is and what he wants from us. David's story here is painting a portrait of God's chosen. The anointed one who's waiting, persecuted by his family and friends, waiting for God to exalt him and choosing not to take the sword into his hand. Does that sound like anyone else to you? God's anointed one who trusts God, who won't use violence to bring God's kingdom, and who waits for God to exalt him in God's timing. David was a, a very good man. We can learn a lot from him. He was a man after God's own heart. I want to be like that. But he made a lot of mistakes. David needed a savior. The true anointed one, the one that all the other anointed ones would bow down to, the one that all of the other kings will bow down to. The humble, suffering, servant king, Jesus. Many of us read this story and we put ourselves in David's position. We, that's very natural. We all deal with leaders and people who act foolish and don't deserve our loyalty. We can learn, we can learn how to deal with some of those difficult people by the way David dealt with Saul. But here's the thing, I don't think we're the David of this story. I think we're the Saul. We are the ones who received mercy when we deserved death. The Bible says we were enemies of God before he saved us. We wronged him over and over. We are the guilty ones. But Jesus, the true king, had mercy on us even though he would have been completely just to give us over to what was good in our own eyes, our own sin and death. But he loved us and he chose to suffer on our behalf. Jesus also had a moment like David's moment in the cave where he was tempted to take the throne. And a moment like the Garden of Eden where he was tempted to reach up and take power. And exalts himself. And he also had a choice whether he was going to take the way of suffering. And in humility, trust God's plan and timing. So we talked about the first two temptations of Jesus earlier. And how they're all about pride, humility, and identity. And this comes from Matthew 4. All three temptations have to do with those three things. Pride, humility, and identity. Will Jesus choose the prideful way or will he be humble and choose God's way? In the third and final temptation, the devil takes Jesus up to a high mountain. The devil shows him all the kingdoms of the world. And he gives him the same temptation that Adam and Eve got and the same one that David got. And he wanted Jesus to reach up and take power on his own terms. So let's read Matthew 4. Starting in verse 8 says, Next the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. This is very early in Jesus' story. This is right after his baptism. Right, It's the first thing he does right after his baptism and his confirmation. So the devil is saying, look, Jesus, you don't have to suffer you don't have to suffer in order to take the throne of, as king of the universe. You can have the throne right now. You just have to do this one itty bitty little sin first. Just reach up and take the power. It's in your hand. Do what is good in your eyes. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Jesus could have taken the power, and the throne in this way. It would have been so much easier. 
He could have just taken the shortcut. He didn't have to suffer to lose family and friends, to be poor, to be homeless, to be beaten and mocked, and to carry his own cross up a hill called Calvary and die a criminal's death on a cross. But Jesus knew that if he took the easy path, we would all still be under the power of sin and destined for death. Jesus took the humble way of suffering. He was eventually crowned king of the universe. But it wasn't in the way that anyone expected. Right before Jesus died, he, the soldiers, they mock him and they give him a crown of thorns. And they give him a robe. And then they give him, they, they laugh at him as they give him a scepter in his hand. And they label him the king of the Jews. This is his coronation as king of the upside down kingdom of God. But instead of a beautifully adorned throne, Jesus takes his place as king on a cross. They were mocking him. They didn't even know what they were doing but they were actually enthroning him. This is the full realization of the upside-down kingdom of God and the upside-down wisdom of God. Because of our humble, suffering king, we are now made right with God, and we have been accepted into God's family. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't take the easy way? Do you have someone in your life, a leader, or someone else who is similar to Saul? Do you have someone in your life who is really difficult to love and difficult to deal with? And every ounce of human wisdom in you says to just reach up and take it. Speak out. Speak badly about them. Try to challenge them in front of other people. Maybe it's your boss. Maybe it's your president. Or your community leaders. Or president. Sorry, I said president already. <laughs> or husband or wife. I'm praying that God is bringing someone to your mind right now. Are you being tempted to reach up and take matters into your own hands? Are you tempted to do what is good in your eyes? Remember what Jesus says in Matthew 23. He says, the greatest among you must be a servant. But those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Don't take the easy path. Follow in the humble way of Jesus. Have confidence in your identity in him. Trust God to fight your battles. Trust his timing. Do hard things. The path that pleases God is never easy, but it's always better. Let's pray. Father, we love you. God, we are humbled that you've chosen us to be a part of your family, that you loved us so much, that you suffered. You lived a life of poverty. That you suffered and died on a cross. You endured the mocking, the beatings, the nails in your hands and feet because you loved us. You took the hard way for us. God, thank you for your humility. God, teach us that. Show us how to be humble in every one of these situations and give us unbelievable security and confidence in our identity in you. That's what we need most of all. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name.